subject of offensive preaching. The just just the, the subject itself, right? Hopefully there won't be anything offensive in this sermon, but I want to teach on this subject really, maybe even more than preach. I want to teach on, on just the, the idea of offensive preaching. And this is extremely important in getting ever more important of a subject to deal with in general. And I want to encourage you to not be discouraged when people are offended at preaching, whether it be from a pastor, whether it be from yourself, whether it be, you know, from, from anywhere. When people are preaching the word of God and people get offended, it can become discouraging. It does have an impact on us as human beings. So first of all, I just want to start off by giving some encouragement. We have one of our own has come under fire recently in, uh, in, in the public sphere. So Brother Devin, has, has, when he filled in for me when I was sick, preached a sermon. I, I thought it was a great sermon, and he did a great job. It's a good job, really good job, a good sermon on when not to compliment people. Very much needed sermon because Christians today kind of have this idea like you just always are complimenting people. Oh, yeah, good job. You know, like two homeboys are getting married. Oh, yeah, good job. You know, whatever, some some unmarried couples having a baby oh congratulations like no 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 like that like it needs to be spelled out so it's a good sermon but uh there's there's people out there that that literally have no lives that hate god that follow new ifb and like i don't know what they would do if we didn't exist i think we give them purpose for their life to be able to go on social media and like just tell other people, ah, look at what these guys believe, look at what these guys are preaching, or whatever. So it, it, it's come under fire recently. It's funny because I was at work on, I forgot what day, was that Friday when I, when I messaged you? Was that Friday? Yeah. Thursday or Friday? I don't know. I, I don't tell you guys, I get, I get calls from time to time from people that are upset with us and, and whatever, and I never really answer the church phone anyways. I always call back if, if it's actually worth calling back because I don't want to deal with that's, I got too busy with too many other things going on to deal with most of this stuff. So um, I get this call, and it was, it was just about Brother Devin, and, but there's no context to the message. It was just saying, like, well, he's the abomination, and Jesus doesn't hate, and all this other stuff. Like, yeah, you know, just blah, 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 a bunch of just, just garbage, right? But there was no reference. I'm just thinking, like, why in the world is someone calling our church about Brother Devin? <laughs> like, what did you do, Brother Devin? <laughs> So I'm thinking like, well, obviously some, something must have happened. Something always happens. It's not, this doesn't just come out of nowhere. Something always happens for a reason. And it's usually because something, someone posted somewhere on the web and then someone else saw it. And you know, now we've got some more bad ratings on Google for our church. Like, like these things, when, whenever anything happens, they sort of come. Then I get some phone calls and, and everything else. Um, and then it usually just dies off. But, I did a search for his name then, and I was just thinking, like, what, what could it be? And, that, and, then, and then it popped up, and there it was. And I was like, oh. And, and I forget the guy's name, and I'm glad I forget it, because I don't even want to say it, because why drive more people to, to this guy, to give this guy more of an audience? I don't think he has some huge reach anyway. It's some atheist that, and some of you guys probably already know about it. I think he, I don't know if he tweets it, or if it's on Twitter, or, or what social media platform it even is. I'm never on Twitter. I'm, I'm almost never on social media in general anyways these days, so who knows, right? Whatever. He posted this thing with some clip, a Brother Devin sermon, where he was talking about that uh, the homos need a bullet to the back of the head or something. I was just like, okay, well, yeah, that's, you know, we believe in, in the Old Testament law that ought to, ought to be put in place, you know? Everything he said, I you know, didn't have a problem with at all. It was, like I said, it was a good sermon. But um, he's all freaking out about that. So then, you know, of course, I find that. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, I, I passed him the link to, to show him where, the, where his little, little moment, his little badge of honor <laughs> is by the, the God-hating atheists that want to point out that we actually believe the Bible. Um, Anyways, I know it's, it's kind of a long story. So it's actually not, shouldn't even be that long of a story, but um, I'll tell you this much. We can laugh about it, and we know the truth about this, and we know that it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But as a preacher, I can tell you this much. Like, it does have an impact on you, okay? 
It's usually not much, but it's, it's there. It's something. There, there's something about human beings. You don't generally like when people don't like you. It doesn't feel good that people are expressing all this discontent and hatred and everything else towards you. As a person, you kind of have a natural instinct to want people to like you, and a lot of times people go along to get, you know, like there's, there's lots of, of things that are done and that we'll naturally do because, because we don't like conflict. You want to try to be peacemakers in general, just, you know, so, so it's not pleasant going through this, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, and especially if it's just continuing going on and on and on, like your Pastor Shelley's dealing with and stuff like that, it, it, it wears on a person, it does. But that's why we thank God for, for men of God, for people like Pastor Shelley that, that just refuse to back down and they're staying strong and staying consistent because they're able to get through all of that garbage and keep doing what's right. Mm -hmm. So we need the encouragement, first of all, when things are preached that are offensive to some people out there in the world and they wanna call you and complain and, and murmur and everything else and try to discourage, well, I wanna encourage. Because the world needs more of that. And if we look down at 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy is, of course, the second epistle written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Timothy was an elder. He was a pastor of a church. He was a preacher. He was someone that was receiving instruction from the Apostle Paul. He was under his tutelage. He's receiving this wisdom. And Apostle Paul is just helping and guiding him in his job to, to be the best pastor he could be, to serve the Lord the way that he needs to do it. And, and Apostle Paul is kind of giving him all this instruction, which is why in chapter 4, verse 1, it starts off with, I charge thee therefore before God. He's giving him a charge, which is like an order or a directive or a mission. Like, here, here's what you need to do, Timothy. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. Okay, that's, that's number one. Timothy, preach the word. And would to God more pastors, more believers would be preaching the word and not just a story from their childhood or whatever and filling up all this time of just talking instead of preaching the word. We need the word preached. Biblical preaching is preaching the word. And then he says this, be instant in season out of season. So what does it mean for things to be in season, out of season? It means whether it's popular or not. I mean, you think about fashion. There are certain seasons when you're supposed to wear white and you're supposed to wear black and you're supposed to wear orange. And I don't know what any of that means because I wear the same thing all throughout the year because I'm instant. <laughs> I don't know what they are. In season, out of season. I'm wearing a white shirt and a tie. <laughs> of the truth, different aspects of things found in the Bible that are popular and then other things that are not. And it changes over time, too. Some things that were not an issue, for example, 20 years ago, now all of a sudden are huge hot button issues that is really offensive. And I'm definitely old enough to have seen the, the drastic changes in culture going more and more godless throughout my lifetime, things that used to be totally acceptable even in the world, world standards, worldly things, on the TV shows, in the movies, all this stuff that nobody would have cared, even blinked an eye at, or would have just thought things were kind of funny. Now it's like, <gasps> Our artists, you know, a lot of these Hollywood people and, and music, musicians and stuff are like apologizing now for like stuff they put out not even that long ago. Like, oh, I'm sorry I said this or did this or, you know, it's like, it's great, it's insanity. And they don't care, they're not really sorry about it. It made them a bunch of money. They would do it again. They don't care. Because it's not about what's true. It's because there's people, as the Bible says here, and, I, and I'll go back and read a little bit more in, chapter two, in verse 2, but look at verse number 3. For there will, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Whereas people, they just simply can't take it. 
Sound doctrines being taught, sound truths from the Bible are being taught, being preached, and there's some people that just won't be able to take it. Just, I don't want to hear it. They just stop their ears like they did at the preaching of Stephen and just run on him and just want to kill him Amen. because they just can't handle the truth. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They'd rather hear a fable is a, is a fake story. It's fiction. They, they go, I'd rather have somebody just lie to me, tell me some nice fairy tales, tell me some nice story, make me feel good. Oh, yeah, I got, it. I got an itch right here. Yes. Oh. oh, yeah, that feels so good. Yeah, keep telling me more about how awesome and wonderful I am and that hell is super cold and, and everyone's going to hell. Yeah, tell me more about that. That's what I want to hear. It's a lie. Yeah. They don't care about that. They heap to themselves. They're, they're looking for who's going to stand up here and tell me what I want to hear. Yeah. Talking about there's people out there that are going to do that. It's happening today. It's happened all throughout history. There's nothing new under the sun. People have been like this for a long, long, long time. In fact, and, and stay here. I'll just read this for you. I've got another reference going back to Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah. They, they, this, this is uh, from Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 8. The Bible says, Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. And this is God speaking, saying that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. It means they don't want to hear it. They don't care about the law of the Lord. They have nothing to do with it. Verse 10 says, Which say to the seers, See not. I don't want you to see. I don't want you to prophesy. I don't want you to tell me what the word of God says or what the message from the Lord is. I don't want to know. See not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. I don't want to know about righteousness. I don't want to know about judgment. I don't want to know about what's right. Speak unto us smooth things. Get it nice and polished up and smooth. Oh, yeah, that, that's going to go down real easy. And then he says, and then it says, Prophesy deceits. Prophesy lies. Right. Well, the more people get wicked, and the more they're looking to just be reaffirmed in their wicked lifestyle, and the more popular that becomes, and the less men of God there are that are actually standing up and saying, No, I am gonna prophesy. No, I'm gonna I'm, it's not gonna be smooth. It's gonna be hard preaching. Yeah. It's gonna be rough around the edges. I'm going to preach it, and this is the way it is. More and more hatred, more and more people offended. Hey, as we get closer to the day of Christ, that's the way things are going anyways. People can't handle it, but we need it. <laughs> we, we don't need lies. Who cares about lies? It, it, this has baffled me. I preach on this before. I still don't understand it. I don't understand what it is about a lie that someone, who would ever want to waste their life on a lie? What a waste. What garbage. What, what like, I wouldn't even want to waste 10 minutes or an hour going somewhere where, where I know someone's going to be lying. Why would I want that? Isn't it just empty? Like, like whatever feeling, whatever, whatever uh, scratch that you get on that itch of what you want to hear, it still is empty on the other end when you know it's not true, if you know it's a lie. I, I, like, I, don't, I don't get where any satisfaction can come. Like, I don't understand people like this at all. Who stand for truth and care about the truth, and want to know the truth and not just have their ears tickled. They turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. The Holy One of Israel is Jesus Christ. They're like, we don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. Make it stop. This is the cancel culture that we're, that we're in right now. I just don't even want to hear about it, it's so crazy and ridiculous. I got an email this week, 
And, and this speaks volumes. It's just indicative about how blind, how ignorant, how, how brainwashed, and how much critical thinking has been thrown by the wayside Every single statement that I actually respond, I normally don't respond to people when they write, but something about his email made me think that this is probably someone who's younger because of the way they wrote. And, and I don't know this, but it just, it just the impression I got from reading it. Like this seems like a young person and they just made all these claims and every single one was false and just patently false. And not just because of what I believe, but just, I mean, just, just I mean, there's, there's like, objectively false like you could just look at that and say like that is just simply not true and people just repeat what they want to hear or what they have heard that they like and just repeat it but it's it's totally factually incorrect and it's like people don't even care and I responded I was just like look if, if you actually if you if you ever want to write someone and you want to convince them of something you, you need to know what you're talking about you have to use facts and truth. You can't just make stuff up and just think that people are going to go along and believe you. are like, wow, thank you for, for showing me the error of my way. When some homo lover wants to, to send me some email tell me why I'm wrong, they start off making the statement that like the, the, the Bible never speaks about homosexuality. Not, not in regards to being right or wrong. It just says, the Bible actually doesn't even talk about homosexuality. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Like, seriously, you must have never, ever opened up a Bible once in your lifetime. Right. To, to say that it doesn't even talk about it, you're insane. Or you're just repeating things that you've heard. You're willfully ignorant. You don't want to know the truth. It absolutely does. I, I, through all these verses in there, I was just like, you can't say that the Bible doesn't talk about this. And then they want to say, oh, well, the Bible's been retranslated so many times and reinterpreted. <sighs> Translated? No. No, it hasn't been retranslated. And this. There's an Old Testament. The people who wrote down the words of the Old Testament used the Hebrew language. Hebrew. Hebrew. Okay, Hebrew. Have anyone ever heard of that language before? Hebrew? Hey, look at that. People have heard of the language. Great. We know the language Hebrew. And then there's also some Aramaic. Okay, there's another language that's mixed in there. Not, not much. And then we have the New Testament that was written down in the Greek like, anyone ever heard of Greek? Hey, that's Greek to me. Okay, yeah, thank you. I know, I know, I understand you didn't raise your hand, but you all have heard of Greek. Okay, I get it. We all know Greek. We don't know Greek. Some of us might know Greek. Don't know. We've heard of it before. We know it's a language. It's a language that the New Testament was written in. Narrow it down to those two things. It was translated into different languages from Hebrew and Greek. Not retranslated. It wasn't like, well, first it was translated into Arabic, and then from that it was translated into Syriac, and then from there it was translated into Chinese, and then from there it was translated, you know, like, like just retranslated over, like, do you even know what a translation is? No, it, that didn't happen. It's just not true at all. It wasn't retranslated. It was translated. Translated in English, you translate, you know, and, and it, the whole point though is to cause, cast doubt on just the, uh, we don't even know what any of this stuff can say. But even that's not true. Even if you want to go to the garbage Bible versions, it's just not true. I mean, you could pull up just about any translation from almost any source manuscript of, 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 a, of a Greek or Hebrew text. And it's going to talk about homosexuality. It's not going to be positive. In every single instance. This is, this is not debatable. It's fact. It's fact. And with basic reading comprehension, you can look at this and say,
this is worthy of death. Their blood's going to be, you know, like, oh, but it's a good thing. Yeah, but God actually endorses that. Like, what planet are you from? Do you, zero critical thinking skills at all. These people don't even care. They don't care about the truth. Now, I'm hoping, I was hoping, the only reason I even spent time answering, I'm just hoping, like, man, is this just some young person that is, is trendy and wants to voice out? Hopefully they're not some homo themselves, and they just, they just feel like, oh, I, need to ta I, need to, I need to send them this, and, and you know, oh. any hope. For some people, though, you need to keep preaching. There's definitely people out there that could think. They are, they do exist. It's truth. This is a great thing about the truth is that the truth fears no scrutiny. About someone uncovering anything, if what we believe is true, hey, everyone can look at it all day long. Yeah, examine it. Research it, look it up. If it's true, it's true. It'll never change. It's a great thing about the truth. Lies, pff, lies always change. People just come up with different things. But the truth, man, that, that remains. It's eternal. Timothy chapter 4, on how to preach. He not only say preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, whether it's popular or not, preach. He says reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, I'll tell you what, when it comes to biblical preaching, when it comes to, to what, what a lot of people get offended at, it's the reprove and rebuke part because reprove is being proven that you're wrong. Repro I need to prove this to you again. I need to show you an area here where you're wrong. And a rebuke might be a little bit harder way of saying you're wrong. It's not right. This is the right way. And then the exhortation is the lifting up and the building up and the edification, encouragement. Two part negative, one part positive in biblical preaching. It's all important, but he starts off saying you need reproof, you need rebuke, and you need to exhort. Do so with all long suffering and doctrine. So when you're, especially in a church setting, being long suffering with people, hey, you're gonna you're gonna hear the reproving and the rebuking for sure from the pulpit. But we're gonna show long suffering with the people that need to implement changes in their lives. Right? Hearing the reproof, hearing the correction, hearing from the word of God, okay, it needs to sink in. We're gonna give people grace and time to 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 be able to incorporate these changes that are necessary. But not only with long suffering, but with doctrine. <coughs> doctrine. It's funny, someone, I'm not going to bring up the reference, but there was uh, someone used the word indoctrinated today, and I'm just thinking, like, yes, that is what we're trying to do. You know what I'm trying to do right now? Indoctrinate you. <laughs> Good teaching. Good instruction. Yes. I don't want to be indoctrinated in the ways of the world. I want to be indoctrinated with the, the ways of God. There's nothing, there's nothing inherently sinful or, or sinister about the word indoctrinated. If you're indoctrinated with all good things, with all true things, with all right things, then you're indoctrinated in a good thing. to do these things, to be able to stand on the word of God, to be able to preach this way, because we know the time's coming when it won't be accepted, and it won't be acceptable. So you just need to get it done now. You need to get the, the patterns formed where you're preaching this way. Now, I've got multiple examples here. I want you to turn to John chapter 7. You say, well, And but that's not how Jesus was, right? They weren't very Christ-like. Okay. Well, we're we're gonna we're gonna see how Christ-like Jesus is. 
That's always my favorite thing. When people talk about being Christ-like, well, what was someone? Yeah, was, that was another thing. I've mean, just been dealing with so many things lately. Like another thing I don't do very often, but for whatever, it must have been because I was sick. I don't know. Maybe I had some extra time. I responded to a YouTube comment also about about something or another because I don't normally go back and forth on the threads, but there's a couple that that I've decided to respond to. It's been a, so long since I've even done that. And where was I going with this? Oh, Christ-like. So, <laughs> some someone. It, it's, it's always the John MacArthur story. Like that's that thing gets more comments than than any other video I think I've ever put up. I don't know why so many people love that guy so much, but. He says, it wasn't very Christ-like for me to call him like a child of the devil or something. I'm like, huh, really? Ah. <laughs> like, and I copied and pasted from like the book of John where he's rebuking the, the Pharisees and like literally saying almost exactly what I said about John MacArthur, you know, it's, and then of course there's like all these responses and stuff and I left it at that, but it was just like, <laughs> think Christ was? People have this idea of Christ. I, I, I swear, I think people must think that like everybody loved Jesus. When Jesus was on his earth, everybody loved him. I mean, he was just like everyone loved him. And I brought this up at the, at the um, retirement home today. Do you really think that anyone would have a problem with Jesus if he just went around healing people? They didn't say anything. I'll just say, because that's one of the things, that's one of the well-known things about Jesus. He did all these miracles. He healed people. And, and it's one of the things that we love to focus on. It's such a great, positive thing. Hey, Jesus healed the sick. He healed all these people. He did all this great work. And who, who would ever be angry except maybe the medical establishment? <laughs> like big, pharma, big Pharma might be angry if you had some guy just walking around and healing people. But, like, that would be it. Everyone else would love, would love someone like that. Everyone would. I mean, he'd be in the news. Everyone would love this guy. Why wasn't that exactly the case with Jesus Christ? Because he didn't just physically heal. He taught. He opened up his mouth. He spake words. And the words that he spake were truth. But the words that he spake caused division. So on the one hand, people could look at the miracles and be like, well, I like the miracles. But then he opened up his mouth and said some things that I don't like. This is of Jesus Christ. Now, some people love the things he said, and some people didn't. But one thing that is absolutely sure and irrefutable is that Jesus Christ preaching caused division. And not just by accident. He knew it was going to happen, and he was okay with it. He was okay with it. He's fine with it. It wasn't something he needed to fix or repair or not say things this way because I don't want people to be divided. And, oh, we all need to just come together. Look, unity would be great if everybody was behind Jesus Christ. But that's the only way. Yeah. Behind his teachings and everything he said, instead of being divided, and some people saying, no, I don't like that. John 7, verse 37. The Bible reads, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying... So it's based on what he said, based on his preaching, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. So definitely, people have heard what Jesus is preaching. They're hearing about this, this water, the spiritual water that's going to satisfy them so that they'll never thirst. They're hearing about this, and some people are, are identifying going, that's Christ. That's got to be the Christ. This is the Savior. This is who we've been looking for. And they were more skeptical. And they didn't just accept what he was saying. And they didn't just believe it. And they weren't accepting what he said. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Verse 4 3. So there was a division among the people because of him. People that normally wouldn't have been divided, Jesus comes along. Now you've got people divided. Because of Jesus, they're divided. 
it happens. So if we go over to uh, Luke chapter 12. on earth. And I think that's what a lot of people thought of Jesus Christ is. I mean, hey, he is the Prince of Peace. Amen and amen. But when he asked this question, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay. He says, I say no. I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but rather division. God is all about division. You see a lot of division, and it stems from light versus darkness. There's division of good and evil. There's, there's, that, that division has existed since existence itself. That's creation. To bring division. Verse 52 says, For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. We have a lot of close relationships here, but Jesus Christ is going to come in and divide people, even between close relationships. And Jesus is fine with that because he knows it's going to happen and expects that to happen. Why? Because some people will accept the truth and some people won't. If your house or if you have people that are dividing from you and don't have anything to do with you because you are clinging to Jesus and they don't want to have anything to do with that. Tell me more about Jesus that you don't believe in and how Christ-like he is. You know, the people who don't believe him want to tell you the most about who he is and how he was and, and all about him and how you're not following him right. statement of what we saw in Luke. You're going to John 6. I'm going to be reading Matthew 10, 34 for you. Jesus said this again, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And then he makes this statement, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Christ should have our, our heart first. He gets that first, that best relationship. We love Father more. If we're, we're going to choose, Jesus brings the vision, but if you're going to choose to be on the wrong side of that division, Jesus on one side, you've got other people on this side, you say, yeah, but my mom's over there, my dad's over there. You know what? You stay with Jesus yeah. in that division. That's, that's where you got to stay. Amen. You can't say, well, I love I love mom or dad more than, you know, I'm going to go over here. Now you just separate yourself from, you know, you're on the wrong side. Wrong side of the division, of the dividing line. And, you know, anyone that preaches the word of God is preaching division. And I'm okay with that. It'd be great if everyone could be in unity, yoked up with Jesus. It's not the case. John chapter 6. I also want to show how Christ-like Jesus was when he handled the criticism, when he handled people murmuring about his preaching. John chapter 6, he's talking about being in life. He said, you know, he, 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 he preaches a sermon, and, and a lot of people don't understand it, and they just don't get it. You know, it's like, well, why do you have to say things like that, Jesus? Can't you just say things different? Speaking, at least. It's what they're complaining about. It's what they're murmuring about. Paul, the instruction to Timothy is a pretty good example for what, type, what preaching should be like. But how about we just look to Jesus and his preaching? 
to what preaching should be like. Disciples, Jesus' own disciples, people listening to Jesus and following Jesus, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Like, I don't know about that, Jesus. Eating the flesh and, you know, I, I don't know about all that, Jesus. I was with you to a point, but not, now you've just gone too radical on me, Jesus. Verse 61 says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, and look, I'd say the, that word murmur is never like in a positive light in the Bible. Yeah. People are murmuring about something. It's not just, it's not just whispering, like <laughs> speaking in a low tone. It's usually like complaining or something else going along with it. So they're, they're murmuring at what Jesus said. They're kind of saying this, uh, I don't know, what's this guy saying? He's off his rocker. What are you talking about here? He said unto them, when he, so when he knows they're murmuring, he says, doth this offend you? Are you offended? Are right, you offended? Hey, there's a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching that comes out of this Bible that offends people. Well, how does Jesus handle that? How did he handle it in this day? He asked them, well, hey, are you offended? Are you, are you offended by this? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Is that going to offend you? It is the spirit that quickeneth, it. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He gives a little bit of an explanation. He says, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my father. Now look at this. What did he not do when he finds out they're offended? One thing he did not do was entreat them. Oh, wait, you, no, 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 you, you guys don't, just don't understand. Hold on, don't go. Don't leave. Because what happened, verse 66 says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. He lost people over this. He lost people over this sermon. He preached a sermon, and people left, and we don't see him going trying to track him down or tell him how they misunderstood him or clarifying his words anymore. He preached. He preached the truth. You know what? Because he doesn't need to. First of all, Jesus is perfect. Now, not every preacher is going to be perfect and say things the right way, but Jesus did. And I'll tell you this much. If you're reading the Word of God and you're just preaching like what the Word of God says and someone's going to condemn you for that, <sighs> there's, I can't say anything better than what the Bible says. People stop following you. Okay, well, Whatever. And then, and then he says this, and, and, and this, this response shows how much, I don't want to say he didn't care, because Jesus cares. It's, it's not that people don't care. I care. If people leave the church and they get offended and mad over something that's preached of the Bible, some Bible doctrine, I do care in one sense. I care because I want everyone to be on board, and I want people to learn the truth and, and be able to, to get on board with good doctrine. So I care about that. I don't want people just, just leaving then. That's not going to be helpful for that person. But I don't care in the sense that I'm not changing. Just because you don't like it and left, well, I'm going to keep preaching what I need to preach. And Jesus is the same way. Hey, he preached the truth. There's nothing wrong with what he said or what he did. And he'd, he'd do it again. And he says this. Then said Jesus to the 12, will you also go away? Hey, these guys all left. You want to go too? You're free to go anytime you want. He didn't soften it up and make it smoother and try to try to pacify people with it. He just kept preaching the, tr the, pr the truth. <laughs> Proof, I kept saying. who preachers should be, what, what a man of God should look like, who Jesus was. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy how many people just have this weird image of Jesus Christ in their mind, but it's clearly not exactly the same as what we see in the Scripture. 
But how about this? How about what, what is a man of God supposed to look like? Oh, you, you, that's not so, you, This preacher, I, I, again, with the comments, people say, oh, this guy sounds so hateful and so whatever and this and that and everything else. And it's like, should I just be loved by everybody? Should everybody just love me? That's how a lot of people think. Oh, this guy's so great. Oh, he's, he goes to these stadiums and he sells out all these coliseums and everyone just wants to go hear him. Everyone wants to go to The President of the United States invited him to swear him in as, the o as, as he takes the oath of office and everybody loved him and everybody's airing it and no one can say anything bad about what this, you know, who this preacher is. And he goes and talks to the Pope, and he goes and talks to the, to the rabbis, and he goes and talks to these other guys, you know, and, and everyone just loves him. Just a great, just everyone loves him. Huh. So, th so this guy's the, a real man of God was able to do what Jesus wasn't doing. Right. <laughs> Jesus is interactions with Pharisees and Sadducees. With them, but we're actually going to literally look at a conversation that takes place while he sat down and ate with one of the Pharisees. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. By everyone. He's the greatest man of God, invited everywhere, brought out for everyone to see. Well, Luke 6, 26 says this, Woe, woe is like having extreme sorrow. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. It's a sign of a false prophet. Just be loved by the world, loved by everybody. Reference here I have in my notes, Luke chapter 11. We're going to see how Jesus interacted here with one of these Pharisees. Now, now look, I, I was, I, in, in all fairness, right, I'm going to say this. Jesus didn't always use the same tone or way of speaking with everybody. It was different depending on who he was talking to. So, you know, we have to understand that, but it wasn't all one way, super nice, super friendly. Was he nice and friendly with people? Of course he was. Of course he was. He was healing people, trying to reach people, you know, uh, uh, having compassion on people. Okay, absolutely, yes. say anything that might offend somebody well at, of course now we've already seen that we've already seen he's offended people we already see he's dividing people let's see it at how he dealt with one of these pharisees look at verse number 37 in luke 11 and as he spake a certain pharisee besought him to dine with him so jesus is preaching and say hey why don't you come and eat with me come dine with me and jesus did he said well he went in and sat down great okay sure i'll come and eat with you he wasn't opposed to it. Maybe he'd be able to teach some truth unto these guys. Maybe he'd get through to them. Fine. And when the Pharisee, and when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So this Pharisee's just like, I invited this this teacher, this rabbi in to meal, and he didn't even go wash his hands. Can you believe this guy? And he's just like in amazement to himself, just looking at this guy, going like. Wash your hands. The, the problem with it, and the, the reason why he had such a big issue with this, now, you know, in our culture, people wash their hands before they eat. You know, I, I usually wash my hands before I eat. Not always, because, you know, it's not a sin. Not to. <laughs> but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with ha holding a tradition and washing your hands and being cleanly and, and clean and everything else with that before you. There's nothing wrong with it. The, wrong, the thing that was wrong with the Pharisees was that they had elevated that rule that they made up that you must wash before you eat to be on the same level as like the law or commandments of God. So they're, they're making up and adding to God's law 
by creating these other traditions, which is why he's looking at them going like, wow, he didn't, you know, like, like they, that was like sacrilege or a sin to them to not wash their hands. And here's this great teacher who's coming in that should know better and he should know all this stuff and he should know he needs to wash his hands, but he didn't wash his hands. And this is his incredulity at seeing Jesus going like, I can't believe this. And Jesus knows this. I think that's probably why he didn't wash his hands, because he knew that this guy was going to freak out about it. And he's going to prove a point. So he sits down, and then it says in verse 39, And the Lord said unto him, showing he obviously already knows what this guy's thinking, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup in the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening, and wickedness. The first thing out of my mouth when I sat down wasn't, hey, you look great on the outside, but on the inside you're full of ravening and wickedness. <laughs> oh, that's, that looks clean and shiny. And you, Did you just wash your shoes? Man, they shine really nice but you are a horrible person. You are wicked <laughs> and just full of iniquity. <laughs> See, this, is, this is what he did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Not just this one verse. We're going to keep reading. That's the beginning. Now, look, I, I think he's probably a little angry that they would even be having this stupid questioning in her mind over him because he didn't wash his hands. Dead. Verse 40, ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. So now he actually gives them, he, you know, he starts off with the reproof and the rebuke. And it's, it's pretty stern. But he gives them now the, the, the teaching, the doctrine of cleanliness. Because they're wrong about what it means to be clean. It's not, it's not about your hands being clean, man. It's not about the outside. It's about the inside. And he sa he's telling them, look. Verse 42, then he goes on, but says, but woe unto you, Pharisees. Look, if you, if you would just, if you'd have the right heart and you gave these alms and help you, you know, instead of being so focused on your money and everything else, and we'll get to that a little bit in, in just a minute about their tithing and everything which is this next verse, but woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, which mint and herbs, these things are, are tiny, like it's small amounts. They're getting these really small amounts of an increase, but they're diligent to make sure that they're paying their tithe on that stuff. That's what's important to them. It's this money side of things or whatever, and just focus on that. Now look, we'll see this in a minute. They weren't wrong to do that either. pass over judgment and the love of God. I mean, judgment, judgment. Okay, we have to separate these because they're two different things. Judgment and the love of God. People like to just talk about the love of God part. That, and look, that's huge. We'll get to that in a second, though. But how about the judgment part? How about good, like righteous judgment? Righteousness. From God's law, not your own made-up laws and traditions and everything else. God's judgment. Yeah, you just pass right over that. You don't care about God's judgment because you make up these stupid rules about, well, if you, you know, father or mother, whatever you get from me, you consider that Corban or a gift. And Jesus said, you know, you, you despise the law of God. You make it of none effect by your vain traditions. They completely overlook judgment and the love of God. Look, the love of God is also important. We were talking about that this morning with the compassion and everything else. Look, you can't overlook that either. You have to have that. 
And those are huge, way bigger than whether or not you're tithing on your mint. Seriously, like in the, in the grand scale of things, oops, sorry, I forgot to pay the tithe on my mint. Well, I mean, look, if you've got the love of God and judgment as your primary focus, got that right, I think that, you know, while you should be tithing on everything, at least you'll be more in balance and, and focused on the, on the most important things in your life. We could continue to work on the things that need work on, but you, you're, you know, don't put the, the least important things to the front. And that's what they did. They cleaned the outside and didn't care about the inside. Need to have done. So the tithing, you ought to have done that and not to leave the other undone. You shouldn't have passed over those things. Woe unto you Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. I mean, he's hitting them right where it hurts. He knows how they are. He knows how they, what, what they're like. He's sitting down to eat with these guys and he's saying, Woe unto you, O ye who love these greetings and, and sitting in these fancy seats and everything. Woe unto you. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And look, he's not just saying this behind some pulpit somewhere either. Just, I mean, remember the context? He's invited to go and eat with these guys. Jesus said behind a pulpit, I'm just saying, like, Jesus was bold. Jesus preached things that he knew would be offensive even to the audience. Because I could preach things here and people would say, oh, yeah, but you're not going to offend anyone because it's, you know, this audience is, you know, okay, fine. Well, he went and preached to people who <laughs> graves which appear not and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. Funny you should say that, lawyers. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. Now, if you're saying all that, then that affects me too. Oh, no, no, no. I, no, lawyer. No, I didn't mean that about you. It's just these guys over here. That's not how he responds. He's not placating people at all. Jesus preaches like it is. The raw truth. Okay, especially to this group of people who needed the rebuke more than most. They needed to be corrected on this stuff, and people needed to hear this, and he let them have it. Verse 46 says, and he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers. Great, now you can see the spotlight from these guys. We'll focus on you for a minute. How about that? For ye laid men with burdens, grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. The lawyers, you know, they're supposed to be law experts. In this case, it would be the law of God. They're supposed to be these, these great experts in the law of God. Yeah, and they're so good at telling everyone else the law of God, this is real, how strict the law of God needs to be and everything else. He's like, you don't do that at all. You're a stinking hypocrite. Yeah, you're great at telling everyone else what the law should be. You don't even do it. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel and of the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation." Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. That's a pretty tough statement, man. You're saying, like, you guys have taken away the key of knowledge. You, you, didn't, you don't have knowledge. You didn't enter into that knowledge, and you're preventing other people from gaining knowledge. Like, they're supposed to be these smart lawyers, and he's saying... You guys are dummies, and you're trying to make everyone else a dummy, too. Jesus dealt with the religious establishment of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He called them out. 
many people would be offended at that preaching. If Jesus were walking the earth today and preaching the Bible, people would be offended at him today too. He would be canceled. He would have all the, the protests and everything else, and people would be calling him a hate preacher and everything. I guarantee you. Why? Because people haven't changed. They crucified him then. They would crucify him now. I don't think the world is more holy than it was during the Roman Empire. We're kind of very similar. <laughs> We're not serving God. Sure, they'd claim to believe in Moses and the law, but they didn't really believe it. They were just full of hypocrisy. Jesus pointed it out. We need more preaching, pointing out the hypocrisies, pointing out the, tr the truth. <coughs> Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We need more of that. Don't let yourself. Offended at the preacher, don't get offended at the preaching. Now, look, I think it is acceptable to get offended if someone is not teaching the Bible and totally making up their own thing. Okay? Now, in general, I still don't think we should get offended. Not gonna, I mean, you could, you could disagree, but what's the point of getting offended? Right? But definitely don't get offended when you hear the Bible taught and the Bible being preached. Look, if it's the Word of God, it's the Word of God. If you're going to be offended at that, you're, you're offended at God's Word, not some preacher's Word. Right? If they're teaching the Word of God, they're teaching good doctrine, they're making the, the proper application. Look. Because I'll tell you what, if you, if you want to go down that route and get offended and everything else, we saw how Jesus dealt with the people of his time that got offended. He didn't go chasing after them. You get offended, you just want to leave. Oh, I kind of want to hear this. and I did. You don't want to hear the word of God. Now look, he may be looking for you and waiting for you to come back, but he's not leaving or changing to come to you. He'll be right there for you. You want to turn back to him and be like, okay, I was stupid. I was wrong. I shouldn't have been doubting your word, Jesus, and getting offended at the Bible. I'm going to go back to you. Great. That's what he wants. But he's not going to compromise the word because you got your feelings hurt. And Jesus apparently wasn't worried about hurting everyone's feelings, which is evident in the way that he preached. He was worried about hurting the Pharisees' feelings. He wouldn't have said that they were wicked and full of hypocrisy and all these other things if he was worried about what they thought. But what he was more worried about was telling them the truth, no matter how much it stings or hurts. And we have to have that approach for the Bible. We love the Word of God. We love the preaching of the Word of God. We need more preachers. Encourage the preachers that come under fire. Encourage them and help them to continue don't stop. Keep preaching. Keep it up. Give the encouragement. We need more of it. This world needs more of it. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for um, the men of God that you've sent throughout history, dear Lord, especially those that we can look to in the Bible and, and look to as examples and all the instruction that we have, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us have a right heart, a humble heart that's open for the rebuke and the correction that we need in our own lives, that we would just be able to get right with you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please um, help us to, to reach more people, to bring the truth out there, and to bring more people to Christ. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for loving us and for your long-suffering and mercy towards us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.